Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the podcast. Today, I'm going to give you a behind the scenes look at an alleged $35 million bank fraud. Now, real quickly, let's lead off. This is an alleged bank fraud in that the person that we're going to talk about in this episode today, he's currently on trial. So nothing's proven yet. Innocent until proven guilty, all that, all that jazz. However, I have a unique backstory with this person. His name's Matt Onofrio. And this is a guy that I met three years ago at a local real estate conference. At the time, he was just this young buck. He was tall, gangly, very sharp. He was a nurse anesthetist. So he was very smart, was working, making a ton of money in that field, and he had just started investing in real estate. And I took a liking to him. He was kind of derpy and naive, but he had this earnestness about him that you know I, I kind of appreciated. And so I helped him out in the beginning. I, I built his website, I did his branding for him, and I built out his his marketing funnel. And you know we were we were close for about six months or so until he went on to the Bigger Pockets podcast, which is if you guys aren't familiar, it's like the the number one business podcast in the world. It's massive, and it's like the number one real estate investing community. So he went on this podcast, and it exploded his visibility, his notoriety. Everybody suddenly knew about him because his story that he told on this podcast was very compelling. Like his rags to riches story and how quickly he was doing it captivated people's attention. And so over the next two and a half years, he just kept flying closer and closer to the sun. He was flying in ever more rarefied airs, hanging out with the likes of Brandon Turner, who is the the host of Bigger Pockets for many, many years. He was hanging out with Ryan Pineda and with uh, Ed Milet or Lewis Howes or Alex Hermosi. And so as he was flying up through the air, I remember thinking like I ha- experiencing a lot of jealousy because we were experiencing incredible growth ourselves at Invictus Capital during this period of time. We scaled from in 2019 when we formed Invictus uh, from to zero dollars up to 70 million dollars of assets in just you know three or four years, which is incredible. It put us as an outlier in terms of our growth. And yet Matt's growth was so much f- more stratospheric. It was just hard to even fathom. In fact, in that time, if my understanding is correct, if we can trust what he said to me, he had done over $500 million of transactions in the same period of time. And so it's easy to look at that and get really jealous. And for a time, I, d- I definitely did get jealous. However, in the end, you know, it turns out that what we were seeing in that incredible growth and the thing that seems so unlikely was in reality probably unlikely to have occurred legally because he probably wasn't playing by the same rules as everybody else or at least that's how it looks now that he's on trial for these these, this bank fraud and so what i want to share in this episode today is four red flags four things that i noticed about six months into my my relationship with Matt, that actually set, set us off on completely different paths. And I stopped talking to him at that point. I stopped associating with him because I, I started to see these red flags and I started to realize something's not adding up. And for the last year, every time I would see him in the news, I would get ever I would get more and more frustrated. He signed a big book deal to write about triple net leases for bigger pockets. I got really frustrated. There's jealousy, and I admit that. And I actually tweeted about this back in June, which was that as harboring feelings of jealousy towards another group and that I've realized those those feelings weren't serving me, that they were holding me back and, and leading me to create excuses for why they were succeeding. And instead of focusing on what I could do to emulate or to improve and become better and compete better, I was choosing to make excuses. And so I tweeted that. And then, you know, six months later, it was revealed, oh, indicted on three accounts of uh, fraud. <laughs> So maybe my gut was right, but it turns out it doesn't really matter because jealousy one way or the other, if it doesn't fuel a fire in you to go and make you compete better, then it's just a wasted um, feeling and you got to get it out of your life and purge it. So what I'm going to share are the four red flags that I personally saw over the years. And um, I think that if you keep these close to your heart and like in the forefront of your mind, they can protect you because we're seeing more and more fraud, like the, the cases of like these large frauds are getting bigger and bigger. You know, you think about Elizabeth Home, Holmes and Theranos. You think about Sam Bankman Fried and FTX. You think about, um, I can't remember the guy's name from Luna, the, the um, crypto exchange. 
And you think about all these things and it's like, man, this is happening a lot. And so these four red flags I'm going to share with you, they can protect you from hopefully being defrauded yourself from, you know, getting into bed with these, these, these people. <laughs> now, all that's to say, by the way, this is, uh, I'm not casting judgment or anything dispersions on Matt and what he's done or hasn't done. I don't know. I don't care. It doesn't matter. The only reason I'm sharing this with you guys is so that we can learn from it. We can improve from it and we can go forward and, and invest better as a result. So number one, the first red flag, TGTPT, which stands for too good to be true. Now, it's interesting with Matt that the the first red flag I saw was the fact that he was consistently getting home run deals back to back to back, like grand slam deals at a rate that nobody else in the industry has could possibly keep up with. And it was really interesting because like when we would ask him and try to get to the bottom of like, where is this? How, how are you getting these deals? The answers were always vague around like, oh, you just have to believe it's possible. It's mindset or you have to be creative. It's about who, you know, and all these things, you know, like not tactical strategies that you would be able to emulate. And so a person who's just starting out on the scene in three years doing something at a scale that even the established companies that have been doing this for 10, 20, 30 years can't keep up with, like it, it starts to go into the realm of this is too good to be true. So that was the very first thing, which was how are you hitting a home run literally every time you step up the bat? And also it seems like you get to go to the bat 27 times, whereas the rest of us only get to go one. And so that's number one, the first red flag. If something seems too good to be true, it probably is, especially in the investing world. Red flag number two is the numbers lie. One of the one of the f- sections of my book, Passive Investing Made Simple, that's been highlighted highlighted the most, and I get to see this on, on Goodreads because like when people highlight things on Kindle, it tabulates it there. So like one of the top highlights is this line that says, the numbers don't lie, but I can make them say whatever I want. And so what this means is that I can hide in complicated spreadsheets and financial models and return projections. I can hide the truth of the numbers. I can make them, I can massage them. I can manipulate them and show what I want them to show. And so if you don't have a baseline understanding of underwriting, financial modeling, returns, projections, all that stuff, then you are vulnerable to whatever I tell you. And on the one hand, you should trust me, especially as your operator, like we're going to partner together. That's inherent. But if you can't look at the numbers and decipher them for yourselves, then you're going to be very, very vulnerable. And when it came to Matt, I sat down with him many times and had him explain to me his underwriting and how he was projecting returns. And listen, like I might not be the smartest person in the world, but I am an industry expert. I've been doing this for a long time and I'm pretty sharp and I could not make heads or tails of it. Literally every time I'd walk away from a conversation with him, if you were to, if you were to ask me to um, explain what he had just explained to me and like recite it. I couldn't have done it, which is at first I took to mean I'm stupid and that he was really smart and like, it was just too complicated for my, my little pea brain. But in hindsight, thinking about it, that's like one of my super skills is to take something complicated and distill it and simplify it. And I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. And so the numbers weren't lying, but he was making him say all sorts of things and I couldn't follow it. Red flag number three, is the power of social manipulation. And this one I personally fell into, which is, and this is, this is exactly what Elizabeth Holmes did. This is exactly what Sam Bankman Freed did. They surrounded themselves with celebrities and with icons of the industry, people who had impeccable integrity or reputations. And when you see Elizabeth or Sam next to so-and-so, a little bit of that person's prestige, a little bit of their reputation gets washed off onto them as a consequence. And this is what Matt did brilliantly. He was hanging out with Brandon Turner, who I respect the hell out of. He was hanging out with Alex Hermosi, who I respect the hell out of. And so when I, when you see that you go, okay, well, I, maybe, maybe I'm just a dick. Maybe I'm just being a doubter. And maybe he actually is legit. Like how is he, how are these people hanging out with him? They, they don't see it. And therefore it's probably me. And I literally went through this thought process of like, maybe I have it all wrong, which prompted 
that text or that tweet where I, where I came clean and I said, listen, guys, I'm suffering from jealousy right now. And I realized it wasn't a helpful emotion. And what, what prompted that was I saw on Alex Ramosi's Instagram, him post about hanging out with Matt. And I thought, man, I respect Alex so much that maybe I'm wrong. And I was open to being wrong. And I, and I acknowledge that in a, in a very public way. But in hindsight, I fell prey to one of the most powerful forms of influence and persuasion, which is social proof. Social proof had me doubting what I thought and what I had held so deeply inside. And I had seen these red flags, but that was enough to make me doubt. And so I, I share this with you because this is, I think, the most powerful one for manipulating people. And it's very easy to do in a digital environment where all you can see is a picture of me hanging out with so-and-so. And you think like, oh, he's legit and great. That doesn't necessarily mean it's so. So there's this, this idea that perception is reality. Um, it's not. But in social media, it is. The fourth red flag to be on the lookout for is the story math. <laughs> the story math just wasn't adding up. And this was the very first red flag that I caught that, that, that really set me off with Matt. When he went on that first Bigger Pockets podcast, he talked about how he was making a million dollars of passive income every year. And I knew from talking to him, to having known his portfolio, to having you know built out his infrastructure, that that just fundamentally wasn't true. That he was misleading the audience based on what he defined as passive income. The buildings were generating a million dollars of revenue in rent, but the vast majority of that, because Matt was over leveraged with 100% debt, it seemed, was not cash flowing a million dollars. It was not putting a million dollars of passive income into, into Matt's pocket. And that was the first thing that was like, oh, he's lying. He's lying out there. And that was the first moment in my experiences with him where I decided I was going to start distancing myself and not, not associate with that anymore. Cause I was like, I don't have time for this. But over the years, that story, those stories just kept getting bigger, kept getting conflated and they started being inconsistent even within themselves. So I started hearing him say things like how he built a $50 million net worth in one year, $50 million in one year, which is ridiculous. But then it got even more ridiculous because the next year it suddenly jumped up to a hundred million in three years. And that's just also quite ridiculous, but not as ridiculous as like three months later, they changed their messaging again. And now they were saying his net worth was $150 million in only two years. And so this outlandish number just kept getting more and more outlandish, but then the time frame in which it was getting outlandish started to shrink. And so it wasn't even in, internally consistent. And I think consistency is one of the most important traits that a human can have. Like I've interviewed hundreds of uh, um, new hire potentials. And one of the questions I always like to ask is like, what's integrity mean to you? Because all companies, you know, they say like integrity is a, is a key value for them. But one of the things is uh, in asking that question to so many people, I've come to realize everybody defines integrity a little bit differently. And, but despite those, those definitions being a little bit different, I did notice like the through line, if you like boiled it down, came down to something to the effect of like, just doing what you say, like being consistent, your word is your bond. Like that's, that's what integrity means to a lot of people. And when people are not consistent with what they're saying or their actions, then we look at them and say, that person doesn't have integrity. And that's where that red, that fourth red flag of the story math, not adding up. That's like where it really hit was that this person is not being consistent and therefore something is not right. Now, I'm not saying that he broke the law. I'm not saying that he's wrong, that he did anything illegal or anything like that. I'm just saying, you know, he's on trial right now being indicted by the FBI and whoever and the SEC. And, you know, that does not look does not look good. But from the beginning, you know, I do not think that he did anything malicious. I think I think it can really easily become a slippery slope of convincing yourself that you're just being creative and you creative your way into a gray area. Um, and that can be, that can be a dangerous, dangerous slip slide. So that's my only commentary on, on that, but hopefully these four red flags, just like being conscious of them, being aware of how they can crop up and how they can be used against you. Like just being aware of that, I think can make you a more potent investor. So I hope that this served you. I hope it brought you some value. If you want to go even deeper into this topic, um, 
my partner, Dan Kruger, and I on our other podcast, Multifamily Investing Made Simple, we did a 50-minute deep dive into the story. Um, go check that out. You can check it out at multifamilyinvestingpodcast.com. And uh, that's going to do it for me, guys. As always, like, it's so cool that you're here. You're joining in. You're trying to be a little bit better tomorrow than you were today. And like, I, I think that's just a really noble pursuit. And so I appreciate you, you know, joining me as I'm pursuing the same thing. If you think there's somebody else out there in your life that would also benefit from joining this journey with us, like do me a favor, share this podcast with them. Seriously, it's how the podcast grows. It's how we keep reaching out to new and um, new and awesome people. And it means the world to me. Truly, it does. So that's going to do it for me, guys. As always, keep being great. And I'll see you in the next episode.